Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part two of the pairwise alignment lecture series. In the last lecture, I introduced the idea of pairwise alignment as probably one of the most fundamental algorithms in bioinformatics. We looked at computing Hamming distances between aligned protein sequences, and we saw how Hamming distance between hemoglobin was associated with the time since most recent common ancestor in, uh, between a few uh, animals. Um, remember, this is where we're comparing human sequences to whale and chicken um, and platypus. Um, we then work through a first approach for aligning a pair of sequences, um, and we talked about how that approach had a few problems. Um, those problems centered around the idea that the scoring scheme that we used was a little bit too simplistic, or maybe a lot too simplistic. It scored all matches and mismatches the same, and it also didn't differentiate between how it scored substitution mutations versus insertion deletion mutations. In this lecture, we're going to continue exploring pairwise sequence alignment, and we're going to learn about an algorithm that's called needleman wench Global Pairwise Alignment. This algorithm is named after its inventors, um, and it is a, a widely used algorithm for a lot of applications. I want to start by talking about how we score matches and mismatches. And for right now, we're just going to focus on substitution events. We're going to talk about insertion deletion events. Um, and remember, those are um, when those happen, we have to insert those um, gap characters or those dash characters. Um, so for the moment, we're going to focus on matches and mismatches. And then we're going to come back to substitution events a little bit later. So the um, sort of two value scheme where we score a match and a mismatch um, with fixed scores. Um, so in other words, any match, um, any, uh, sorry, any pair of um, nucleotides that are matching get one score and any pair that are mismatching get another score. <clears throat> Works okay for nucleotides, um, but it doesn't work quite as well for protein sequences. Um, the reason is that substitutions um, potentially have a lesser impact on structure of a protein um, if, uh, uh, if they're nucleotide substitutions in a protein coding region. Um, I'm going to come back to that um, in just a few minutes because it's not necessarily always true, of course. Um, substitutions in proteins arise from there being substitutions in nucleotides. <clears throat> but substitutions in protein sequences um, have a much more, or have at least a much more, um, a much higher potential to have a direct impact on the host phenotype. And let's talk about this by looking at an example. Um, so the slide that I have up now is an image, um, it's a cartoon image of the three-dimensional structure of a sodium potassium pump. Um, and this comes from the Protein Data Bank Molecule of the Month uh, series. If you're interested in protein structure, that is a great resource to um, start uh, looking at. Um, they have a lot of um, images like this, along with discussions about um, protein structures, how protein, um, how protein molecular machines work, um, and, and things like that. Very cool resource. We're going to look at it in just a minute. <clears throat> Um, but what you'll notice here, so this is, um, this is a molecular machine that is pumping um, sodium out of the cell. And so if sodium is building up inside of a cell, this machine will activate and it runs on ATP um, and it'll pump sodium ions from, uh, from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. Now, as, as I'm sure you know from your cell biology courses, um, the cell membrane is hydrophobic on the inside, um, and the interior of the cell and the exterior of the cell are hydrophilic. Um, so what that means is that you will find um, water molecules um, uh, much more frequently uh, inside the cell 
and outside the cell. Um, but this region um, that uh, composes the cell membrane is hydrophobic. And so you um, will expect to see much less water in there. And this is essentially what, of course, creates the division between the inside of, and the outside of the cell. Now, the way a molecule like this, um, this sodium potassium pump, ends up spanning the cell membrane is that some regions of it, um, like this region in here, tend to have a lot more hydrophobic residues in them, amino acid residues in them. Um, and then the regions that are either outside the cell or inside the cell tend to have a lot more hydrophilic amino acids um, in them. And so when this um, when this member or when this uh, membrane bound protein is tr uh, translated and it adopts its shape, um, it has an affinity for spanning the cell membrane because the hydrophobic um, residues um, are essentially at like a lower um, well it'll be at a lower energy state if they are um, found inside the cell membrane. Um, and the hydrophilic um, residues um, tend to have this affinity toward being either outside the cell or inside the cell. So um, now thinking about substitution mutations and which ones are better tolerated or worse or less, uh, less well tolerated, um, the amino acid residues, like I said, inside that span this region inside the cell membrane, are going to be, um, they're going to tend to be more hydrophobic. And so if you have um, a uh, substitution in a protein, so there's a mutation in the DNA that results in an amino acid change in the protein, and that changes it from uh, a residue from a more hydrophobic to a more, uh, changes from a more hydrophobic residue to a more hydrophilic residue, that has the potential to disrupt the structure of this molecule. Um, and uh, it also has then the potential to disrupt the function of this molecule. Um, and so if you see some hydrophilic amino acids um, building up inside this region uh, in the cell membrane, it might be that this uh, protein won't embed itself in the in the membrane as well anymore or maybe it won't embed itself in the same way in the membrane anymore and that might cause the molecular machine to not function anymore um, similarly if you were to see a mutation that resulted in new uh, a new hydrophobic amino acid um, in this region down here outside the cell that might also alter the um, structure and potentially the function of this molecule. Now let's just take a minute and um, get another view of this. Um, so I just switched over to the Protein Databank website. Um, and this is that same molecule that we were just looking at. Um, I'm going to try and orient it um, similar to how it is in that uh, image. And so if you take a look at this again, you can see it here, <clears throat> and I've tried to orient this in roughly the same way. Um, this is actually made up of a few different polymers, um, and so you can see like that's what some of this color is here. So like this purple, um, cyan, this darker blue, um, and so that's what we have in here. It's purple, green, orange, and this viewer is pretty cool. Um, it like lets you, for example, um, compare the sequence to the um, structure of this protein. And so if I highlight different regions of this protein, I can figure out where those are in the sequence of this molecule. And so if I hop back to that cartoon view, um, I can see that the middle of this protein is the membrane bound region. Um, and one thing that's neat that I can do with this viewer is I can um, set some coloring um, and I can um, color the amino acids by their hydrophobicity. Um, and so in this example, or in this coloring scheme, what's happening now is like these greenish and yellows 
are now the more hydrophobic amino acids. So you can see like valine, um, uh, let's see, it's a little hard to hover over it. Uh, but these tend to be the more um, hydrophobic amino acids. Um, and these reds and oranges are the more hydrophilic amino acids. Um, and so I can turn this around and get a few different views. Um, and you can see there are some hydropho uh, hydrophilic amino acids in there, but they tend to be in the middle of this protein. And so um, what's happening there is like this inner channel um, is not necessarily exposed to the um, uh, to the in, uh, intramembrane environment. Um, and so these um, like red amino acids that you might see in here, these are charged amino acids. And so these might be what are drawing the, the uh, ions through the center of the channel. But on the outside here, you can see that I've got these hydrophobic amino acids. Um, let me just see if I can get it to you. It's a big protein, so I've got to figure out where I am in there. Whoops. Okay, so I just zoomed all the way in. Another cool feature, um, but let me zoom back out. Um, you can also see, like, when I clicked on that, what it did is it started, it changed how it drew some of these amino acids. And so it's doing a ball and stick model instead of this, like, ribbon um, secondary structure model. Um, but anyway, if we sort of look at this, we can kind of look down the barrel of this channel now. Um, and you'll see, like, there's more of these um, charged amino acids and hydro other hydrophilic amino acids when we look at the ends of this molecule here. Um, these are some other small, um, small molecules that are bound um, to this um, sodium, uh, sodium potassium pump. <clears throat> um, and so, um, what what I want you to take away from this here is that the um, in a protein the primary structure in other words the sequence of amino acids in that protein is very important for determining the um, secondary tertiary and quaternary structures and so that would be um, for example like the local structure um, like this alpha helix here would be the secondary structure the tertiary structure refers to um, how this molecule as a whole folds. Um, and then the quaternary structure um, describes how it interacts with other proteins. And so, um, you know, for example, I, we see this purple and this cyan protein in here. Um, and so the interaction between those would together form the quaternary structure of the protein. Um, and so, when we think about aligning pairs of protein sequences, we should be thinking that um, uh, amino acids that are more similar to each other chemically should be preferable to align with one another. Those would be more biologically relevant alignments. Um, and so over um, the course of probably the last 50 or so years, um, people have developed um, various different approaches for scoring um, or, or relating the similarity of amino acids. And a very common one that's used in protein sequence alignments um, is uh, what's known as the Blossom 50 amino acid substitution matrix. Um, so in the, um, in the chapter that um, goes along with this video content, I talk a little bit about where these substitution matrices came from. Um, so I'm not gonna spend time describing that here. Um, but what you can, um, um, let's, but let's take a look at this for a minute um, and see what we can figure out from looking at this. Um, so the Blossom 50 amino acid substitution matrix is a matrix that basically describes um, how similar or different pairs of amino acids are. And so you can look up any pair of amino acids in here. Um, and so I'm going to look up, um, for example, two that I happen to know are very similar to one another. Um, and that is isoleucine, which is um, abbreviated by I, 
and leucine, which is abbreviated by L. And so if I want to figure out how I should score an alignment of an isoleucine and a leucine, what I would do is I would come across here until I hit the L column, which is this one right here, and I would see that this is telling me that I should score that as a positive 2. Um, we could compare that, for example, like if I were to align an isoleucine with another isoleucine, in that case I would score that as a positive 5. Um, and so what that tells us is that a match between isoleucine and leucine is more um, uh, is, is uh, more likely, more um, uh, re, uh, say a better alignment than aligning an isoleucine with a leucine. So now let's look at another example. So um, if we end up with an isoleucine and we'll take something that's very different this time, I'll look at the tryptophan amino acid, which is um, represented by a W. Um, in that case, um, these are pretty different from one another. And so this would end up getting scored as a minus three in this case. Um, and so um, like that positive score um, between isoleucine and leucine of two suggests that those are more similar to each other. Um, the higher positive score between isoleucine and isoleucine indicates that those are the most similar um, uh, to an isoleucine, obviously. Um, and then this negative score indicates a dissimilarity um, from isoleucine. Um, there, there are some interesting things that you can figure out if you look at this matrix. Um, and so, um, for example, like if I run down the diagonal here, um, you can see that these are all positive scores. And that is because this represents all of the times where I would be aligning one amino acid with the same amino acid. Um, you may wonder why that differs, like, you know, for example, why right here does a valine aligned to a valine um, only get a 5, where a tryptophan aligned to a tryptophan gets a 15? Um, well, that is because the tryptophan is a much more unique amino acid relative to all of the other amino acids, um, and so it ends up getting a higher score um, because it's, it actually kind of serves as like an anchor point when you're doing an alignment. Like if you see um, some tryptophans in there, you can usually assume that those are going to align with one another because the other amino acids are so much more different from that that it would usually be associated with um, a, uh, a more deleterious change. Um, another amino acid that falls into that um, category would be proline. Um, proline has some interesting impacts on the structure of a molecule, um, and so it ends up um, having um, a relatively high self-alignment um, uh, self score. Um, and so if you see a proline and a proline, those will often um, be a sort of an indicator that those positions align with one another. Um, some of the more, um, or say, I'll say less unique amino acids like leucine and isoleucine, which are pretty similar to one another, um, end up with lower match scores, but still, of course, a positive match score because they are um, uh, very similar. They're the same amino acid in this case. Um, okay, so I mentioned that um, having a two-value system works okay for nucleotides. And so you might be wondering, well, why does it work okay for nucleotides? Because substitutions in nucleotides are where substitutions in amino, acid, uh, in amino acids come from. Or, uh, yeah. Um, the reason for that is because there's actually, um, that actually comes down to the structure of the genetic code. Um, and so we've looked at this um, image a few times now throughout the course of uh, this course. Um, and so um, what you'll notice here, what I want to show you this time, um, is that there are um, there is a decent amount of redundancy 
built into this genetic code. And remember that that's because there are 64 codons, but only 20 amino acids and a stop signal that they need to encode for. Um, and so, for example, if we had a protein coding region where there was a substitution from a CUU to a CUC, that would result in no change at the protein level. And so those are equally well tolerated in just about, uh, in most cases, those should be equally well tolerated, a CUU and a CUC. Um, similarly, either of those could change to a CUA. Um, there's also some interesting higher level structures um, that were more recently um, illuminated. But for example, like you can see here that the CUU, if this first nucleotide underwent a uh, substitution to an A, you would end up substituting leucine with a very similar amino acid, isoleucine in this case. Um, and so some of these um, mutations are, can be very well tolerated at the nucleotide level. And so sometimes they'll have um, no impact on the amino acid that is being created. Sometimes they might have a, a relatively small impact on the amino acid that's created. Um, and of course, there are times where they will have a big, I mean, uh, a big impact on the amino acid that's being created. Um, or the signal that's being sent to a protein. Like an example here would be if you had a UAC to UAA substitution, um, that would prematurely terminate that, um, that protein. And so, you know, it, there are cases where um, nucleotide substitutions are going to have a big impact, um, but there are also cases where they'll have little to no impact. Um, and so while not ideal, um, that's why this sort of two-value um, two scoring system does seem to work okay for a lot of nucleotide sequences. Okay, so now I want to jump into the Needleman-Wunsch pairwise sequence alignment algorithm. This algorithm starts in much the same way as the, uh, the simplistic one that we looked at. Um, so imagine that we want to align two sequences. Um, we'll, we'll think of this one, this top one is sequence one, this bottom one is sequence two. The first thing we do is we create a matrix that has sequence one on the horizontal axis and sequence two on the vertical axis. When you create this matrix, it should have one extra row and it should have one extra column. Um, so uh, if you're following along here, you should notice that like you basically have these four empty cells up in the top left. Um, this, the two sequences that I'm aligning here um, are two protein sequences, like you can see, and these are derived from an example that was presented in a classic book on this subject called Biological Sequence Analysis. Um, this book is probably about 15 or 20 years old now, but it is still um, one of the best books that I'm aware of on this topic. And so if you want to learn more about sequence alignment, um, that is an excellent resource um, for, for your learning. Now, as we work through this example, I, we're going to need to be able to refer to the cells in our matrix um, directly. So refer to individual cells. We're therefore gonna use I to represent row numbers in the cell. And so over on the left, or uh, row numbers in the matrix. And so over on the left here, I have um, indicated that the rows are I, and they start with zero and go through seven, not including this first um, like header row that we have in here. Um, and the columns are columns um, 0 through 10, um, again, not including the sort of header column here where the sequence is. So if we want to um, address a specific cell in the matrix, we can do that by referring to its ij coordinates. Um, and so, for example, this cell here, it's um, cell i0, j0, and so we would refer to it as 0, 0. This cell down here 
is row one, so I1, column zero, so we would call this one one comma zero. This one over here is row zero, column three, so it would be zero comma three. Um, this one here is row two, column two, and so it would be column two, two. Now, the first step in a Needleman Wunsch uh, alignment algorithm is to fill in values in cells in this matrix. Um, these values um, are going to be used ultimately to determine the score of the matrix and to also identify the highest scoring alignment of these two sequences. Let's start looking at the formulas we're going to use here. I have the first um, pair of, or the first set of formulas um, are listed below. Um, and there's a few variables um, or bits of nomenclature that I have in here. So first, F is what I refer to as the dynamic programming matrix, and T is the traceback matrix. Now, if you're also uh, reading this material in the book, um, which I strongly encourage you to do, the, these lectures are intended to be read or to be um, watched as a companion to the reading. Um, you'll remember that I represent these in two different matrices. When I do this on paper or on my tablet, I usually do it just in one matrix because we can fit the information in there and it just makes for um, a lot less writing. Um, the other variable that you should be aware of now is the gap penalty. Um, this is a score that is intended to be used to um, penalize the introduction of a gap character into a, sequ into a sequence alignment. Um, recall that the gaps are those dash characters um, and we use those to represent locations where we hypothesize that an insertion or a deletion event occurred over the evolutionary history of that pair of sequences. Now, as I have indicated over on the right, we are going to be treating uh, or we are going to be using a value of eight as the gap penalty. Depending on what, uh, uh, depending on the sequences that you're aligning, um, as you gain some experience with using these algorithms, you might choose to use different gap penalties. Um, so, for example, if you think it's very unlikely that a gap would be introduced in your pair of sequences, you could increase the gap penalty. If you think that for whatever reason it's more likely that these sequences would have gaps introduced into them, you could decrease the gap penalty. We're going to start with a default value of 8. Um, okay, so now we can start working through and filling in cells, uh, values for the cells in our matrix. Um, the first one that we have um, is uh, an easy one. Um, this is um, telling us this first cell or this first line here is telling us that in cell 00, zero so recall that is this cell right here, we're going to fill in a value of 0. Um, so that one's easy. In our traceback matrix, um, we would look at the corresponding formula. And what this tells us is that in cell 00, zero of the traceback matrix, we would put this um, bullet, which remember we're using to represent the end of an alignment. <clears throat> I'm going to put that in the top left of the cell. Okay, so we're done with that top line. Let's move on to this next line here. Um, and I'm going to jot some notes down underneath as we go. So we are now going to compute the value for this cell here. Um, since that is row 1, column 0, we're going to call that cell 1, 0. Um, so we can see that this formula here um, would be the relevant one for filling this value in. Um, and so this is going to be equal to f i minus 1 comma 0 minus the gap penalty. So since i is 1, we would have 1 minus 1 comma 0 minus 
8, our gap penalty. That would, of course, be F00 minus 8. And so if we look for cell 0, 0 in our matrix, we can see it's this one that we just filled in. And so that gets this value, or that, ha <clears throat> that has a value of 0 in it. And so this formula will be reduced to 0 minus 8, which is negative 8. So we'll fill a negative 8 in for that value in the cell. Now if we look at our traceback, this is telling us that we should be putting an up arrow in that cell in the matrix. Now these um, arrows, basically uh, what these are telling you is what cell was referred to in computing the value for the current cell. And so like in this example, I referred to F00 when computing the value negative eight, which is going in the cell F10. And so my arrow is pointing up at cell 00. Since the value in um, 00 didn't refer to any other previous cells, it gets this bullet. Um, and so that is um, like, again, sort of our terminal character. Okay, so let's do this again now. Um, let's now compute the value for cell two zero. So F two comma zero is going to be equal to F two or I minus one zero minus our gap penalty. This is equal to F one zero minus our gap penalty. And so if we look at cell one zero, that's going to be this one. It's row one, column zero. We have a negative eight in that cell. And so we would have negative eight minus eight equals negative 16. I'll fill in minus 16. And because I referred to cell F10 in computing this, I am going to point my arrow up at cell F10. Let's do another one. Let's compute three zero now. So F three comma zero equals F three minus one comma zero minus D. Um, and I put D up here, but that, um, in my previous examples, I, I did eight, so let me just substitute that. Um, and so now I am referring to cell F20, which is gonna be this one that we just computed, so minus 16. So we have minus 24. And again, because I was referring to cell F20, I am going to point my arrow at cell F20. If you ever forget what it is you're supposed to be doing there, you can just sort of refer over to the corresponding um, formula for the traceback matrix. So you can probably see what's happening here. Um, each new row based on this formula is getting the value of the previous row minus eight and our arrows are always pointing up. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and fill these remaining values in. And I encourage you to keep working through those if it's not entirely clear um, how those were computed. Um, so I have now finished with this formula. And so I can move on to this bottom formula. Um, and so this time I am always in row zero and I am varying the value of J. And so if we start with F zero comma one, that is going to be F zero one minus one minus D. Um, 
for consistency. Again, I will say minus eight. Okay, so that is F zero comma zero minus eight. And so if we look up zero comma zero, that is this value here. So we will end up with zero minus eight, which is equal to negative eight. That probably seemed pretty familiar from what we did before. Um, let's move on to F zero two now. So F zero comma two equals F zero two minus one minus eight. So that will be F zero one minus eight. Um, if we look up um, the value in F zero one, so that's gonna be row zero column one, that is that negative eight that we just filled in. So that's going to be minus 8 minus 8 equals minus 16. Again, this is probably seeming pretty familiar. Um, this formula is essentially doing the same thing um, along the columns as the first formula did along the rows. Um, and so each um, cell is going to get a value of um, the preceding cell, the cell to the left, minus 8. And so I'm just going to go ahead and fill those in again. And because each of these is referring to the cell to the left, I'm going to fill my arrows in all pointing to the left. Okay, so we are now done with um, all of the formulas on this first page. And so what remains to be done is to fill all the values in um, in the other cells in this matrix. Um, and so we get a, f a couple of additional formulas for this. Um, and this initially might look a little bit scary, but it's actually pretty straightforward. The first thing I want to mention, though, is that we are now going to be um, using a new value here. Um, we have a new variable, which is S, our substitution matrix. Um, and so the substitution matrix is um, something, I have this over on the right side of the screen as well. Um, and this is how we determine the score associated with substituting one amino acid for another. And so we talked about the Blossom 50 scoring matrix just a few minutes ago, and that is the one that we're going to use in this example. I'll show you how to use it when we get to it in just a second. Okay, so if we now want to start, say, with this cell right here, um, that is cell F11. I'm just going to make a note here that for this case, I equals 1 and J equals 1. And then that way we'll just have those to refer back to. So this formula um, might look a little different from your typical mathematical formula because it contains a function in it. And that function, whoops. Um, that function is the max function. Um, that means that we are going to take the maximum of a few different values that we're going to compute. Um, so each of the lines in this formula represents a different value that we're going to compute. So if we do this first one, um, so that is going to be f i minus 1, j minus 1. Um, so that will be F zero zero. And this is where our substitution matrix comes in. So it's plus the substitution of character I for character J. And character I refers to the character at row I in the matrix. And so in this case, I is one. So that'll be the character P. So it'll be the substitution of P for character J. 
so character j is here um, and so that would be j is one and so that would be this h in column one of the matrix and so it'll be substitution of a p for an h now this is going to be equal to the value in f00 which is that zero right there so it's going to be zero plus and now we would pull out our substitution matrix which again is over on the right side of the screen and look for the value of substituting p for h um, and so for example find the row that starts with a p and then follow that across until you get to the column that starts with an H. And when you do that, you'll see that the value negative two is in that cell. And so this row would evaluate to negative two. Moving on to the next row, we're now computing um, based on the value F I minus one J. So that would be F zero comma one minus our gap penalty which is eight and so if we look for cell zero one in our matrix that would be this one here and so we would put um, a minus Eight minus eight, which is equal to minus 16. The next thing that we would do is we would compute this third formula. Um, so here, this is F I J minus one. So remember I is one. So it would be one comma zero minus eight, our gap penalty. And so if we look up um, row one, column zero, that's also gonna be this value of minus eight. And so we would have minus eight minus eight equals minus 16. So the max of these now is what this, uh, is, computing the max of these now is the last step of uh, solving this formula. Um, and so the max value of 2 minus 16 and minus 16 is, of course, negative 2. Um, and so F11 is going to get the value of negative 2. Now, if we refer to our traceback mate, oops, um, If we refer to our traceback matrix, we can see that because we used this first row, this row ended up being our max, we would use the corresponding row um, in this traceback. Um, and so that would be the diagonal arrow. We of course also knew that because when we computed this value, we referred to cell F00. And so the other way to think about this is we are just pointing at that cell that we previously referred to. Okay, so I'm gonna move through a couple more of these, um, and I strongly encourage you to follow along and do some of these on your own. Um, I'm gonna do probably about two or three more of these. Um, I would encourage you to go and do another five or seven after, I, uh, after the ones that I do. If you do that, it'll really solidify these concepts in your head and computing these um, does actually get to be pretty easy once you sort of figure it out. Okay, so I can now choose um, one of a few cells to compute next. Because I need to refer to the cell diagonally to the left, up and to the left, I can only compute um, cells in this matrix where I have values in those three cells. So right now I could compute this cell or I could compute this cell. I couldn't, for example, compute this one until I've computed this cell and until I've computed that cell. So let's go ahead and do this one here next. So that is going to be cell F12. 
So i equals 1, j equals 2, and so f1, 2 equals max f0, 1 plus substitution of, and now this will be character i, so that'll be this p here, and character j, so that'll be this e. So remember, this is just corresponding to row one and column two. So the value of f zero one is negative eight. And if I look up the substitution of P for E in my substitution matrix, I can see that that is minus one. And so that gives me a minus nine for this first row. Um, for the next one, I minus one. So that's gonna be F zero comma two minus eight. So if I look up zero comma two, so that is going to be row zero, cell two. So that is going to be the value of um, minus 16. Uh, minus eight equals minus 24. Um, and then for this last one, so this will be f i j minus one. So this will be one, one minus eight. And so if I look up cell one, one, that is gonna be this one here, so minus two. So that is gonna be minus two minus eight equals minus 10. And so the max in this situation is that value of minus nine. Um, so I will fill in minus nine in cell one, two, so minus nine. And because this was, again, um, this top row, that means I referred to cell, um, I referred to cell F01 in that computation. And so I am going to point at 01. So now let's move on and we will do the cell right here. So in this case, now we are looking at I equals two, J equals one. So F two comma one equals max of F one comma zero plus substitution of a for an H. And so the way I figured that out was I looked at row two, so that's that A, and then column one, and that's that H. Um, the value in cell one zero is minus eight. That's this cell right here. And when I look up um, the A to H substitution in my substitution matrix, I see that that value is minus two. Um, so it would be plus minus two equals minus 10. Okay, so now F I minus one J. So that would be one, one minus our gap penalty of eight. So cell one, one is this minus two here. So that is gonna be minus two minus eight equals negative 10. 
the last row that I need to compute, this one here, is f i j minus one. So that is gonna be f two zero minus our gap penalty. And so two zero is gonna be this value right here. So minus 16, that's row two, column zero. Um, so minus 16 minus eight equals minus 24. So we've got a bit of an issue here. Our max value shows up twice in here. So we have max of minus 10, or we have two minus tens showing up. So it doesn't matter so much which of these choose. It, does, it will potentially impact the final alignment, but we don't have a reason to believe that either of these um, is a better value to choose in this situation. Um, and so what matters here really is that we're consistent. And so what an algorithm would typically do if this was um, say coded on a computer is it would do, do the same thing every time this was encountered. And so it might be something like choose the first value. So like always choose this top value. Or it might be something like of the tied values, choose one at random. Um, for our case, working on pen and paper, it's easier to just pick something simple like choose the top value. And so we're gonna treat that as the rule that we follow when we encounter ties. And so I'm gonna choose this top value of minus 10. And because this one referred to cell F10, I'm going to point my arrow at it. Um, and so again, what really matters with something like this, when you're thinking algorithmically, is that you're consistent in how you make a choice. Um, so it doesn't mean you're always choosing the same thing. It could be that you call a random number generator to um, essentially like do a coin flip between those ties and you go with whatever outcome that presents you with. Okay, so now what I would encourage you to do is pause the video for a few minutes and work through a few more cells in here. Um, there's now three cells that you could compute. You could compute this one, this one, or this one. I encourage you to at least compute um, a couple of those. Um, if you really wanna get some experience, go ahead and compute five or seven more. I went and um, completed this whole alignment. Um, and so I did this, um, I did this um, based on looking these values up um, where I had computed them with a computer. And so I did a few more of these myself, um, but then automatically generated the full set of answers. This would have taken a long time to compute by myself. Um, I have also <clears throat> um, listed all of the formulas that we used at this stage. So these are um, all of the formulas that we were using. Um, and um, this should now serve as a good um, reference sheet for you if you wanted to do this for some additional examples. But at this stage, we are now ready to trace back our matrix um, and get our highest scoring alignment. And so the way that you do this with Needleman Wunsch is you start at the bottom right corner and you trace back following the arrows. And so I'm gonna do that right now. So you can see what I'm doing is I'm simply following the direction of the arrows that we drew in as we we're filling out the traceback, uh, or sorry, as we we're filling in those values in the traceback matrix. Now what you do um, is you can actually transcribe the, uh, the alignment. Um, and so I wrote the rules down over here on the right. Um, and so when we move diagonally out of a cell, 
we transcribe or consume the row and the column characters that correspond to that cell. Um, when we follow a left arrow, we consume only a column character. When we follow a vertical arrow, we um, consume only a row character. Um, and so I'm gonna start down here at the bottom. Um, I'm gonna follow this first um, diagonal out of the cell. And so what that means is I transcribe an E and an E. And so I'm gonna jot those down down here. I'm now in this cell here and I have a vertical arrow moving me out. And so when I have a vertical arrow, that means that I transcribe a row character, and so that would be that A, and I insert a gap in, my, uh, in the other sequence. And so the um, row is gonna correspond to my bottom sequence here, and I'm gonna insert a gap in my top sequence. That puts me in this cell here. And so I'm now gonna follow this cell out. Um, and that means that I will transcribe the corresponding column character and the corresponding row character. And so that means I will have E and E. That puts me here. I've got another diagonal. And so I'm gonna transcribe H and H. That puts me in this cell here where I have my first left facing arrow. And so that means that I consume or transcribe a column character, so a G, and I insert a gap in my other sequence. And so now I have a G and a gap. That puts me here, where I have a diagonal arrow, so I will transcribe a W and a W. Which puts me here, I have um, a left-facing arrow, and so I am going to consume a row, uh, sorry, a column character, so that A, and insert a gap in my second sequence. So I've got an A and a gap, which puts me right here, um, another left facing arrow. So I'm gonna consume this G and add a gap. That is gonna put me over here. And so now I have a diagonal arrow, so I will consume the A and the A. That puts me in this cell with another diagonal arrow. So I will consume or transcribe the E and the P. That puts me up here in this cell where I have a left facing arrow. So I will consume that H and add another gap. And so there is the complete alignment. Um, and in fact, the best possible alignment of these two sequences, given our gap penalty and our substitution matrix. If we were to use different values for the gap penalty or the substitution matrix, we may or may not end up with a different best alignment of these sequences. The last thing that we do here is we transcribe the score. And by definition, the score of a needleman wunsch alignment is the value in the cell that we began transcribing from. And so that would be this bottom right cell. And so the score of this matrix, or the score of this alignment is the value one. needleman wunsch is the most widely used algorithm for doing global pairwise sequence alignment. And what I mean when I say global is that we're aligning both sequences from the beginning 
to the end. This has a lot of important applications. For example, the um, uh, hemoglobin sequences that we we're looking at at the beginning of this chapter, um, if we wanted to do um, an evolutionary analysis of those, we would probably use a global pairwise alignment. We'd probably use Needleman Wunsch to align those sequences and do some of that analysis. There's another very commonly used algorithm for doing sequence alignment, um, and uh, that's known as Smith-Waterman alignment, and that does what's known as local sequence alignment. In a local sequence alignment, we have a pair of sequences that we suspect may partially overlap with one another. And the Smith-Waterman algorithm will give us the best possible alignment of all or part of one sequence to all or part of another sequence. Um, this is, um, uh, uh, at least theoretically, how the BLAST web server works. Um, and so in that case, you have one sequence, that would be your query sequence, and you have the database that you're searching against, which could be represented as one long sequence. You could then query your um, sequence against that database using a Smith-Waterman alignment, and it would give you um, uh, it would give you a match that tells you where the best um, region of that where the best match was in that database to your query sequence. Um, so global and local alignment are both used very widely, um, but for pretty different applications. The next content in the book covers Smith-Waterman local sequence alignment. And uh, as you read that, um, you'll notice that it really is just a variant on the needleman wunsch algorithm. Um, it does a few things differently in terms of how it scores cells in the matrix, and then the traceback step works um, slightly differently from the global alignment traceback. Um, aside from that, though, if you know how one of these works, you basically know how the other one works. You're just using a little bit of a different formula as you work through them. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of this lecture. Um, in the next lecture, we are going to spend some time looking at um, how this algorithm scales and um, uh, maybe, uh, if we have time, a few variants on um, how this algorithm works.